you have any Christmas traditions? I'm sure you do. Maybe you have a certain meal that you eat every year. Maybe you have certain people that you eat that meal with. Maybe you open a gift on Christmas Eve. I know many families do that. Maybe you open all your presents on Christmas Eve. Maybe you go looking at Christmas lights, or maybe uh, you go singing Christmas carols somewhere. Uh, Reagan got excited when I mentioned opening a gift on Christmas Eve. I'm not talking about you, Reagan. You have to wait until Christmas Day. <laughs> Just one. Okay. Fair enough to talk to me, too. We all have Christmas traditions, I'm sure. Uh, maybe you listen to Bing Crosby. Maybe you watch Jimmy Stewart. Can I tell you one of my favorite Christmas traditions? I did it just last night. Every Christmas since I was a little kid, at some point during the Christmas season, I either read or watch Dr. Seuss's How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Any, any Grinch fans in here? I can't be the only one. Amen. These are my people. I love the Grinch. And uh, I, I love the old classic cartoon, you know, the one from the, the 70s or whatever that was. I've seen the full length ones. I saw the new one already this year. I mean, I pretended I was taking the kids, but I couldn't wait to go see it. But, uh, but I love the Grinch movie. There we go. I love the Grinch. Uh, now, I told y'all I wasn't going to do a, a Christmas message uh, per se. We are going to start Job last week. And then with the snow and, and not starting Job, I didn't want to start Job today and then break, uh, which I won't be here next week for Christmas, but you know, we'll be on vacation. So, uh, so I decided instead to do a Christmas message. And today I want to talk to you about the Grinch. Now, normally I, I, I don't do messages like this. I'll go through a, a passage of the Bible, but today I want to talk to you about the Grinch, that man who tried to steal Christmas all those years ago. Now, maybe you're not familiar with the Grinch. Is there anybody here who's never seen it, never read it? Good. All right. If somebody said they've never seen the Grinch, we're going to have some problems today. Now, I'm, I'm glad everybody here is familiar with the Grinch, but, if, but just to refresh your memory, he was a 53-year-old green creature who lived just north of Whoville. He had a cave in the mountain, and from where he lived, he could look down over the, the mountain, he could see all the Who's down in Whoville. Now, if you know this about the Grinch, you know the Grinch hated Christmas, the whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be, perhaps, that his shoes were too tight, or it could be that his head wasn't screwed on just right. But the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. I told you I've seen it a lot. <laughs> His heart was too small, Dr. Seuss tells us. Two sizes too small. Now, Dr. Seuss uses his heart metaphorically to tell us this, that the Grinch had no capacity to love. The Grinch did not do what the Bible says and loved his neighbor as himself. In fact, whatever the reason, his heart or his shoes, the Grinch stood there each Christmas Eve hating the Who's. He was selfish. He didn't care about anybody else. In fact, he was willing to go to great measures to make sure that his own needs were satisfied. He couldn't stand the who's singing. He couldn't stand them celebrating Christmas. And so he hatches this plan to go steal the whole thing, break into every house, steal every present, every ornament, even the who hatch. I mean, it doesn't get much worse than that. And so he comes up with this plan. I'm going to steal all this stuff from the who's. And it shows us, and I know he's fictional, but it shows us that he had no capacity to love. Dr. Seuss says his heart was too small. Now, he was not referring to that organ inside the Grinch's chest. He was talking about who he was as a person. And so here's what I want you to know this morning, is that God does not want you to be a Grinch. He doesn't want me to be a Grinch. He has not called us as Christians to be Grinches. But I wonder if there's a Grinch in our midst today. Are you a Grinch? Do you just say bah humbug to the whole thing? And I don't just mean hating Christmas, but maybe just in life. Are, are you a sour person? Are you somebody who's just always down in the dumps? Are you somebody who likes to bring others down with you? Or are you a person who typically has a smile on your face? Now, I know things are going to happen sometimes. We're going to wake up and we're going to feel sick and we're not going to smile as much that day. I know people are going to pass away and, and we're going to shed tears and we might not smile as much that day. But I mean more often than not, are you a person who would be considered? a Grinch, or are you a person who has the love of Christ having warmed your heart and shining through each of your actions? If you have your Bibles today, I want you to turn to just a two-word verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we'll turn to Matthew in a minute after that, but in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're going to look at a very short verse. For many of you, you know John eleven thirty five 35 is the shortest verse in the Bible. It simply says, Jesus wept. Well, this verse is right on its heels. Again, just two words, but has a great impact. 
Theologically speaking, and it means a lot more to us than Jesus weeping at a funeral. This is a command for us to obey. Are you there in 1 Thessalonians 5? Verse 16 simply says, rejoice evermore. Aren't you proud of me? I memorized that verse. I didn't have to turn there. Rejoice evermore. The verse could not be much simpler. Now, it may be hard, to, of course, to do sometimes, but it's, it's a simple verse in its point. Rejoice evermore. As Christians, shouldn't we be people who are known, who not only rejoice, but who rejoice evermore, always? When we wake up, we rejoice. It's a new day of life. Now, maybe your alarm clock goes off a little too early, and maybe you don't rejoice quite yet when you wake up. Maybe it takes you a little bit. But when we begin a new day of life, we should rejoice. We say, this is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Are you a person who rejoices? But we have a lot of reasons to rejoice. God has been good to us. Now, we may focus on a few of the negative things, but if we were to really step back and take stock, wouldn't we have to admit that God has been good to us? He has done so much for us, and we have reason to rejoice. As Christians, we can rejoice evermore. Now, the world, the unsaved, they don't have a whole lot of reason to rejoice, at least not to rejoice evermore. They rejoice sometimes. Even the unsaved, they'll rejoice at the birth of a baby. The unsaved, they will rejoice when their team makes the playoffs. They will rejoice if they get what they really, really wanted on their Christmas list. And they will rejoice. But those things are temporary. Those things are not eternal. Those things come and go. But as Christians, we can rejoice evermore because what God has done for us is of much more importance than getting what's on your Christmas list. It's of far greater value than if your team makes the playoffs. And as much as we rejoice when a baby is born, what God has done for us far surpasses even anything physical down here. We have reason to rejoice evermore as Christians. We can rejoice because of what has been forgiven. We can rejoice because of what is prepared in heaven. We can rejoice because of the one with whom we are living. Right now, as spirit-filled Christians, we have reason to rejoice. So when we gather here today, we sing Christmas carols. We sing Heart the Herald Angels Sing. Harold, is that your favorite Christmas carol? I mean, your name is right there, right? It's got to be. <laughs> he was so excited we sang his song. I mean, if it was Heart the Tommy Angels Sing, I'd love it. I know that's Harold's song. When we gather, we sing Christmas carols, we ought to rejoice. Not just for the nostalgia. Oh, I remember singing that with my grandma back when I was a kid, when Christmas was magical. Not just because it's nostalgic. We rejoice because of what the songs tell us. When we sing Joy to the World, the Lord has come. We can sing that song rejoicing. Understanding that Jesus left heaven and came down to earth so that he could save us. When we sing Go, Tell It on a Mountain. Over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on a mountain. What? That Jesus Christ is born. We can sing that song rejoicing. Knowing that Jesus was born for us. So that he could die for us. So that we can live with him. So that we can live for him. When we sing these old Christmas songs, we should rejoice. But not just the Christmas songs. We can rejoice always. Whatever we sing. Oh, you sang a song again. I didn't know that when it was a new one. I don't like new songs. But we can rejoice when we sing a new song. We can rejoice when we sing an old song. If the message of that song lifts up Jesus Christ, if it points us to the cross, if it makes us think of heaven, if it reminds us that we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, then we can sing it rejoicing. So when we sing, oh, victory in Jesus, we can sing it rejoicing, knowing that he has sought us and he has bought us with his redeeming blood. When we sing holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, we can sing that song rejoicing, knowing that he is the one who's worthy to be praised, that all his works will praise his name in earth and land and sea. He is merciful and mighty. And when we sing these songs, we can sing and rejoice. Amen. But what about you? Can you sing and rejoice? When you sing these songs, does it do something to you? Do you feel it down deep within you? Can you sing it rejoicing? As Christians, we should be known as people who rejoice. But let me ask you something. If you can't come rejoice in here, do we really think you're going to go rejoice out there? If you can't come praise God in his sanctuary, surrounded by fellow Christians, are you really going to go lift up his name around your unsaved co-workers? Are you really going to rejoice in front of your classmates who don't go to church? If you can't come praise God in here, 
Are you really doing it out there? Jesus said, let your light so shine before me. No one lights a candle and puts it under a bushel, but you let it shine light to all that are in the house. When we come here and we sing, it is part of how we can call people out of darkness and into God's marvelous light. So don't sing like a sour puss. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. We don't care if you're tone deaf. We don't care if you're off key. I mean, come on, I just sang. It can't get much worse than that. But we should come and lift up our voices to the Lord today out of a grateful heart for what he has done for us. It's one of the ways we attract people to Christ. So let me give you three reasons today why we as Christians can rejoice evermore. First of all, we rejoice because of what's been forgiven. Have your sins been forgiven? And what an incredible gift it is to know that your sins have been forgiven. Think about this. Have you ever stabbed somebody in the back? Let somebody down? Betrayed somebody? You give them your word and you don't follow through and then you feel guilty about it. Oh man, they're never going to forgive me. That person is never going to trust me again. Never going to be my friend. Maybe it's a, a boyfriend or girlfriend. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe you think, I've blown it this time, and that's going to be the end of my marriage. And then that spouse comes, and they say, I forgive you. I, I'm willing to work through this. And you feel like this burden that's been on you has been lifted off. Now, what a blessing it is to know that we've been forgiven. But not just with each other. Think about when we sin against God. And to know that that burden of guilt can be forgiven. It can be lifted from us. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Matthew 18. This will be the last place we turn. This is a very important parable. Jesus gave this parable. It's known as the parable of the unforgiving servant. Now, the context of this, not going to read the whole thing. The context of it is if God has forgiven us, then we ought to be able to forgive each other. But we're not going to go through the whole rest of that parable. I want us to use it to focus on the first half of that simply, that God has forgiven us. If you're a Christian, God has forgiven you. Wipe your sin away, giving you a clean slate. If you're in Matthew 18, before we begin reading here, just to tell you real quick, this is about a, a king who is settling up some of his accounts. And he's got this one guy who owes him a great debt. The Bible says he owes him 10,000 talents. Now, how many of you have ever spent a talent? We, we probably don't even know how much a talent is. But let me tell you, a talent was the equivalent, if you take the average daily work or what a person might make for one day of work, a talent would take about 16 years to earn. 16 years to earn a talent. This man owed 10,000 talents. He would have to work three complete lifetimes in order to pay back the debt that he owed this king. Now, I'm not good with math, but I've seen that this, if you try to put it into today's economy, based on what the average person in America might make in a day, this would be over $2 billion of debt that this man had accrued for himself. $2 billion. Could you pay back $2 billion? Neither could this guy. Look at verse 26, if you would, please, of chapter 18. Verse 26 says, So the servant fell on his knees. Imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. No chance he wasn't going to pay him everything. Verse 27, it says, and out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. Moved with compassion for the plight of this beggar. He loaned out 160 years of salary to this man. 10,000 talents, $2.3 billion I've seen. He's loaded out. This guy says, oh, please, please have mercy on me. I'll pay you back. I'll give you everything. I just need a little more time. And he says he was moved with compassion. Out of pity, he said, you know what? I'll forgive it all. Boy, mercy might have said, I'll give you another month or I'll give you another year. But in grace, he says, I will forgive it all. I will act as if you have paid me back 10,000 talents. I will act as if you've just given me back $2 billion. He didn't give him a nickel. But he says, I will treat you like you've paid every last cent. How do you think that man must have felt? We've seen the rest of the story. He goes and he finds a guy that owed him about 100 days salary, and he throws him in prison because he can't pay up. And that's why the parable is, if God's forgiven us, we better be able to forgive. Has God forgiven you? Has God wiped away <coughs> your sin? Now, we're all sinners. We all have sinned. I'm not asking if you've stopped sinning because you've gotten saved. I'm asking if God has wiped away your sin, removed it as far as the east is from the west. 
Jesus says, I will choose not to remember your sin. In justification, God declares us as if we have never done anything wrong in our lives. But you know everything you've done wrong. I know everything I've done wrong. But God says, when I look at you, I look past that. And I look at the righteousness of my son Jesus, who died on the cross and poured out his blood for you. Though you're a sinner, I will act like you're not. I'll treat you like you're perfect because of what Jesus did. Remember his last words on the cross? When he hung on the cross and he said, it is finished. In Greek, he simply said, to telestai. It means paid in full. Some old legal documents have been found in Jerusalem. Ledgers that showed where money was owed. And then written across it after the debt had been settled up was the word to telestai, written across the pages of the ledger, meaning paid in full. When Jesus poured out his blood for us, he said, that's it. That was the price that God required for their sins to be forgiven. It is paid in full. I have paid the price. Peter says he did not redeem us with corruptible things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of a lamb without blemish or spot. Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but Jesus washed it white as snow. Do you know that your sins have been forgiven today? Those sins that have separated you from God, have they been removed? Have you ever felt that burden lifted off of your shoulders? And that's why we sing. That's why when we gather here, we lift up his name. Because we know what he's done for us. And when you feel that, what does it make you do? The correct answer is rejoice evermore. If you're having a bad day, remind yourself of what has been forgiven. Every lie ever told, everything ever stolen, every time you took his name in vain, every time you lost your temper, every time you robbed him by withholding your tithes and offerings, every time you gossiped behind somebody's back, every time you broke a promise, every time you said, God, if you do this, I'll give you my life, and you didn't follow through. Everything we've ever done wrong, and God has removed it from us. If you're having a bad day and you say, well, how can I rejoice with all that I'm going through? You just remind yourself of what has been forgiven. Amen. Remind yourself what Jesus has done. That he paid a debt he did not owe. Because I owed a debt that I could not pay. And I rejoice today because of what has been forgiven. Amen. We were shackled by our sins. We were servants of Satan. We were slaves to his schemes. And Jesus broke the power of that sin with his death on the cross. But thanks be to God, my sins are forgiven. And I rejoice today because of what has been forgiven. But that's not the only thing. I also rejoice today because of what is prepared in heaven. You remember John chapter 14? I can quote this one too. It's more than two words. But this is a great passage of scripture. In John 14, Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, dwelling places, rooms. We talked about that the other Wednesday night. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I am going to prepare a place for you. And he says, and if I go and prepare a place, guess what? I'm going to come again. I'm going to receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. If you're having a bad day, you can rejoice because of what is prepared in heaven. He says, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. So let me ask you a question. Is he preparing a place for you today? Is he working on a room in the Father's house? Is he getting ready to move your stuff on in? He said, well, hopefully not anytime soon. Maybe not. But is he preparing a place for you today? Forgiveness of sin is great. Forgiveness of sin allows us to straighten our back and walk with good posture saying, I know who I am in Christ, forgiven. Forgiveness of sin gives us a little pep in our step. But understanding that that leads to us being able to one day live in the Father's house. That's just icing on the cake. We love heaven, don't we? The idea of heaven has excited believers for the last 2,000 years. Not only does God dwell there, but all the dead in Christ are also there. For many of you right now, you're thinking, that's my mom, that's my dad. That's grandma, that's grandpa, that's a child, that's a, that's a husband, that's a wife. I've got people that are waiting for me there in heaven. And we think, boy, one day I'll get to be with them again. I think one of the most moving parts of the funeral for George H.W. Bush was when his son closed and he said he's hugging Robin and he's holding mother's hand. And what a beautiful picture that was. He had already mentioned their daughter who died 
as a child and his wife who had just gone on about a year ago. And for many of us, we put ourselves in those same shoes thinking, well, when I get there, I can't wait to, to hug that person that I haven't wrapped my arms around in years. I can't wait to hold hands with that spouse that I haven't held that hand in years. And we look forward to heaven because of who is waiting for us on the other side. And I've got people I can't wait to see. I've got people I can't wait to meet. I've got a lot of questions I want to ask a lot of apostles and saints and prophets. But more than anything else, I can't wait to see my Lord and Savior. Amen. Who poured out his blood for me. Who prepared that place for me. Who forgave my sins so that one day I can go to the Father's house. I don't know about you, but I can't wait to see it. I'm enjoying my time down here, God. I'm not saying hurry it up. You take your time preparing that place, God. But when the time comes... I know what awaits me. I rejoice today because of what's being prepared in heaven. Amen. If you don't have a home being prepared in heaven, what's the alternative? On Wednesday night, we flipped all the way to Revelation 21. At 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we looked about hell and eternal destruction. Remember what it said in 1 Thessalonians 1? It speaks about the hell that is what? Prepared for the devil and his demons. God's preparing a place one way or the other. He's either preparing for you a home in heaven, or you will spend eternity separated from God in the, in the hell that was prepared for the devil. One way or the other, we're going to live in a place that God prepared. The choice is up to us. Why would a loving God make a place like that? Why would he send somebody to a place like that? Well, that wasn't the original plan, was it? He made Adam and Eve, and they were perfect. And Genesis tells us that God came down, and he walked with him. Can you imagine that? Adam and Eve and God strolling through the Garden of Eden, picking fruit off the trees, talking to God. That's why God made them for that relationship with them. But they sinned, and God withdrew, and God said, I can no longer come down there. Now that our sins are forgiven, God is still up in heaven. He's still not coming down here because he cursed this planet in their sin. I love how the New England Primer put it. All those years ago, it simply says, in Adam's fall, we sinned all. Paul was a little bit more of a theologian than Ben Franklin. So Paul in Romans 5, he put it like this. By one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. Now death has passed upon all, because all have sinned. But Paul continued in that discourse in Romans. Paul continued uh, by saying that it was by one man that death entered the world, but how much more by the actions of one, he says, Christ Jesus, shall many live. Amen. What an incredible thought from the Apostle Paul. We have reason to rejoice. Now one day heaven is going to come down here. One day our happily ever after. It's not, I'm going to be in heaven forever. No, we're not. John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth come down from heaven. And the dwelling place of God is now with me. And heaven will come to earth. And as God once walked in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, he will one day walk with us down here in that Amen. new Jerusalem. And so one day it's going to be perfect down here. And you know what the Bible says? It will be there that there will be no more crying, no more mourning, no more tears, no more sickness, no more suffering, and no more death. Because the former things have passed away. And maybe the greatest phrase in all of Scripture says, and there was no more curse. No more curse. Hallelujah is right, Rick. No more curse. Think about it. Every bad thing that has ever happened to you is a result of the curse. Every bad thing that has ever happened to you is a result of the curse. You say, well, why would a good God, or how could God, or where was God? It's the curse. The answer is always the curse. Every bad thing that has ever happened, but one day we know that we will be in a place where there's no more curse. And, and old Satan, that old liar, will be cast into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever, never again to try to bring a curse upon God's people. We can rejoice because of what's been forgiven. We can rejoice because of what is prepared in heaven. But there's one more thing I want to mention. We can rejoice because of the one with whom we're now living. Let me ask you a question. If Jesus never mentioned heaven, would you still want salvation? If Jesus never mentioned the new Jerusalem, if he never mentioned hell as an alternative, would you still want a relationship with Christ? In other words, is Jesus enough? 
Boy, we get excited about heaven, and rightfully so. And praise be to God for making a place like that. But is Jesus enough? If there was no heaven or no hell, would you want a relationship with Jesus? Jesus should be the reason that we call out to him. Not, oh, because I don't want to go to hell one day. No, I want to be in a relationship with Jesus right now. Amen. We make heaven and salvation like it's only future, but it's also present. Salvation does not begin when I die, unless you mean when I die to myself. Salvation began the minute I was born again. Salvation for me began and heaven began when I put my faith in Christ. And now God says, you know what? I can't go down there even though you're forgiven. I can't go down there, but I will take a part of my Holy Spirit and I will put him within you. And so right now as Christians, you see it on the screen. He's filled us with his Holy Spirit according to Ephesians 5.25. God has put his spirit within us. And so every day when we wake up, God and heaven are not just a million miles away. It's right here within us. And so we talk to God when we pray. He talks to us when we read his word. He has filled us with his Holy Spirit. Jesus is a friend that is closer than a brother. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. The Holy Spirit is our counselor. And God is our Father in heaven. And hallowed be his name. If you're a Christian today, do you have a relationship with God? If you think you can live down here apart from him, and then one day go up there, you might want to check your salvation. It doesn't work that way. We have a relationship with God right now. Why did God make people? Why did he create us? It was to have a relationship with us. That's what he wants. Many of us, we just want heaven. God wants you. We want to escape hell. Jesus wants you to talk to him. Being a Christian is not about future tense stuff. It's about right now. It's about Jesus riding shotgun with me when I drive down the road. You can even use the carpool lane because Jesus is right there with you. Now, if you get pulled over here by yourself, don't tell anyone I told you to do that. But you got to think he's right here with me. At all times, God is with me because he is as a Christian. But if you were to survey Christians across North America and ask every Christian you meet, explain to me why Jesus came. Explain to me what life is about. Explain to me why God made the world. Explain all this stuff to me. And I believe 99% of people won't be more than 10 words in without using the word heaven or hell. And, and we need to understand those places are real. But if we think that's all it's about, then we're missing out on a lifetime with Jesus right now. Now, we have eternity to spend with him, but it begins right here and right now. We need to understand that salvation is about being with God. You know why one of the reasons why people aren't coming to church anymore like they used to? For some of you, when, when you were coming up and everybody went to church, and you lived in a maybe a mill village and the entire mill all went to the same church. You know one of the reasons people aren't coming anymore in this country? They are all over the world. But you know why they're not as much in this country? We stopped offering them something for right here and right now. We have reduced Christianity down to what happens when you die. And people are 25 years old saying, okay, fine, you know what, when I'm 80, I'll go to church. And we have stopped offering people something right now. And Jesus came so that we can have life, not just eternal life, but abundant life down here. Life with God today. Boy, we, have, we can offer people the greatest thing in this life. And that's the King of kings and Lord of lords to be right here with you. Amen. Now. Today, So let's stop making heaven just some future tense thing. And let's let people know, hey, God can save you right now. He can change your life today. He can fill you with your, his Holy Spirit. I'm not saying he's going to make you a millionaire. I'm not giving you that kind of gospel. But I'm saying he will go with you through the fire. He will go with you through the trials. When you cry out to him, he will be there. What a blessing it is to have him right now in my life. I rejoice today. Because of what's been forgiven. I rejoice today because of what is prepared for me in heaven. But I rejoice because today I've already spent time talking to God. Amen. I've already spent time talking to the one who poured out his blood for me. I rejoice because of the one with whom I'm living right now. Amen. You know that old Grinch? He didn't have much to rejoice about. Or so he thought. And he couldn't stand that other people were happy when he wasn't. But you know what happened to the Grinch? Those who's. He stole their Christmas. He took everything they owned. 
And they woke up and they still were singing. They still were rejoicing. They still were smiling. I can't help but think that they must have the love of Christ within each one of those who's. But it was the singing of the who's. It was the rejoicing of the who's. It was the love that they showed that began to warm that heart of the Grinch. That was two sizes too small. Well, what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And he was changed. Because of the rejoicing of the who's. So maybe you're like the Grinch and you say, my heart is two sizes too small. I have no capacity to love. Well, let me tell you this. You call out to Jesus Christ today. Let him lift that burden from you. He will forgive your sins and your heart will grow one size. And then you will realize that he's right now preparing a place for you in heaven where you can live with him forever and ever. You can be with him forever and your heart will grow a second size. But he will fill you with his Holy Spirit. And as you walk, you can talk to him. He will make intercession for you. When you don't know how to pray as you should, he will pray with groanings that can't be uttered. And you will grow ever closer to him day by day. And your heart will grow a third size. I'm telling you, if you want to be able to rejoice evermore, then you just call out to God for forgiveness of sins. You start a relationship with God. And you have heaven to look forward to. And we can truly rejoice evermore. God does not want you to be a Grinch. And you don't have to be because of what Jesus has made available to you. If you've never been saved, put your faith in Christ today. Let him wipe the slate clean. Let him forgive you of your sins. Maybe you've been saved, but you've kind of slipped back into your old Grinchy ways. You haven't rejoiced much lately. You haven't smiled much. Maybe it is when big things happen. When a baby's born, when your team makes the playoffs, when you get what's on your Christmas list, then you rejoice, but not evermore. Maybe some sin has crept into your life and has damaged that relationship with God. Remove it today. Repent of it. And like David prayed in Psalm 51 after he committed murder and adultery, and he prayed, God, restore to me the joy of thy salvation, and he'll do the same for you. Repent of your sins, put it away, and God will make you like a new Christian all over again. And you will be able to rejoice evermore. As a Christian, your rejoicing may make the difference in the life of someone else. Maybe a Grinch is looking at you today. And because you smile during bad days, because you rejoice when life is hard, maybe your rejoicing will warm their cold heart. So we have much to rejoice for today. Let's rejoice evermore. Would you please stand this morning with your heads bowed and your eyes closed? As our musicians are getting getting into place, very simply today, maybe there's something in your life that you know needs to change. Maybe you haven't rejoiced like you used to. Maybe God feels far away. Maybe your salvation has always just been about not wanting to go to hell one day. Maybe you want to come and start a real relationship with Jesus. Maybe you want to cry out to him right where you stand. Would you forgive me my sins, God? Would you save me? And he'll do that. If you want to come forward for prayer, come kneel down here. Somebody will pray with you if you'd like, but use this time now. If God has convicted you or challenged you or is leading you to do something, I ask you to respond in obedience to him. Father, I pray right now that if your Holy Spirit is moving, or maybe someone needs to step out from where they are and walk down here and just say, I don't know if I'm saved. God, I pray that we'd see salvation come here today. Or maybe someone wants someone to pray with them. Maybe someone is mourning and they want comfort. Maybe someone is burdened for someone else and they want to make intercession. Lord, I pray these next few minutes that we'd be obedient to you. Lord, I'm thankful that you are a God who forgives sin. I'm thankful that you are a God who will prepare a place for us in heaven. I'm thankful that you are a God who wants a relationship with us right now. Lord, I pray that we take advantage of that. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Use this time to talk to the Lord.